have people back in uh, Lippin House Museum again after uh, several years of having these conversations virtual. So we're so pleased that you're all here tonight. I guess that's not <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Kathy Saunders. I'm the curator of education here at Lippet House Museum. And this is the ninth year that we have done a community conversation series in partnership with the League of Women Voters of Providence. And we're so pleased to be doing that again. In last year's conversation, our topic was climate resiliency. And in that series, we met Julia's co uh, <laughs> um, uh, Julius Kalawa. <laughs> That's good. We're doing a slow start. <laughs> Julius, who's edging his way in the back there. Uh, um, uh, Julius was with the African Alliance of Rhode Island. And after that session, Julius showed up on our door and said, What are we going to do next? <laughs> and uh, this series this year is a result of that conversation. Uh, so last week, in the first part of the series, we had three people share personal stories. Tonight, we're shifting gears, and we've invited three local leaders to talk about how their organizations are supporting civic participation for immigrants. Tonight's program will be one hour, uh, with time allocated for questions. Uh, to leave more time for the discussion, we're not going to go through their extensive, uh, memorable bios. Instead, we have put them on your chairs along with uh, information about each of the sponsoring organizations. And with that, I want to take an opportunity to thank Liz Head, introduce Liz Head, and thank the League of Women Voters Education Fund for their financial support of this series. And Liz from the Providence League of Women Voters is going to say a few words. <laughs> I just want to, I, I too want to welcome everybody. It's really great to see it. almost a full house. Um, the the Providence League of Women Voters is very happy to co-host this series again with the Lippitt House Museum. The League is a nonpartisan organization. Voter education, voter registration, and election reform at the local, state, and national levels and support of legislation such as the John L. Lewis Voter, uh, Voting Rights Act is at the heart of the league. We believe the strongest democracy is one in which the, uh, the voices of all participants are heard. As such, the league is committed to helping new citizens become active in American political life. We also study, develop positions, and advocate on issues impacted by government policy and legislation, including federal immigration laws that provide efficient, <coughs> expeditious systems for immigrants to enter the United States. For more information about the League and voter information, see the literature on the table in the front hall, and it's all the way in the back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> by the coats. <laughs> so uh, we have little cards there that have uh, the Secretary of State's website and you know the thing about online uh, registration and uh, asking for a mail ballot, which by the way the deadline is passed for that for the early primary voting. early voting. Early, early voting now. Early yes. voting is still on this program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, for those of you new to Lippitt House Museum, civic engagement is a part of the Lippitt House's uh, mission, which is inspired by the Lippitt House families, sorry, the Lippitt House, the Lippitt family's long tradition of public service. As a history museum, tonight's topic of immigrant civic engagement is particularly relevant since immigration has always been a part of Rhode Island's history. For example, in 1910, one third of Providence residents were foreign born. In the 21st century, immigrants continue to contribute to Rhode Island's vibrant culture. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the facilitator of this evening, uh, uh, Pastor Price, uh, of the African Policy and Research Institute. 
Thank you so much and good evening everybody. Thank you all for coming today and thanks to the sponsor of this event. I'm excited to be here today and having this conversation with uh, my great colleagues that are sitting today right here. And to thank you for taking the time to be here and your support for this issue. It's an issue that is absolutely very important and for the same reason that we're a country of immigrants, some happen to come here earlier than others. And we have new arrivals who are coming who need to be integrated into the system and participate in our civic life. Because more participation brings about a better democracy. And our democracy is at risk today from what we have seen. And we must strengthen and not weaken our democracy. And that is what this conversation is all about tonight. I'm Pastor Chris and pastor of the King Stabenacle Church. And in my day job, I work for Rhode Island Governor Dan McKee as Deputy Chief of Staff. And I'm here today with Umar Ba, and I represent the uh, African Policy and Research Institute, and Marcella represent the Latino Policy Institute. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have a good crew here today. And our institutes, what we have set out to do is very simple. And for the same reason that one in every eight persons who live in the United States is an immigrant. And in 2021, data show that immigrants supported our United States economy to the tune of $500 billion. And 22% of every single entrepreneur, whether they are in Silicon Valley or here in Boston, in our life science hall, 22% of every entrepreneur here in the United States are immigrants. And here in Rhode Island, 85,000 85, individuals are of African descent. And each of them contribute greatly to the economy and social life of our state. And we cannot and must not ignore that block of people. And that's why this conversation is absolutely important. And I'm glad that we're having it today. And with that, I pass it on to Maba to introduce himself, and then uh, Marcella will as well. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Chris. It's an honor to be at the table with you, and um, Marcella. So it's, uh, it's actually an added honor to be sandwiched by the two. <laughs> 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 one, one to the north and one to the south. <laughs> I'm, I'm double honor. <laughs> Well, thanks. Uh, the, the context you gave about immigration and the, the statistics is really fascinating, and that is the reality of what we are uh, experiencing right now as a country. And I really want to thank Kathy also for the context. 1910, you know, I wouldn't think so. I mean, even in this building where we are, probably immigrants built it or probably participated in it. And yesterday I was in Manchester, New Hampshire, for a conference, and. We were reviewing some statistics and we looked at some of the statistics of immigrants without documentation in the United States. Here, 400,000 are people of Canadian or European descent. Immigrants without documentation. We, really, we are not talking about immigrants, just the folks without documentation. They form 4% of that population. And guess what, are African? 3%. You would not think. So, so when she mentioned the numbers in 1910, it just dawned on me what I was talking about yesterday, what I was reviewing yesterday. The concept of immigration and the notion of immigration changed when folks start thinking, oh, it's the global south, is when they don't look like us. Uh -huh. When they don't look like the regular person, then it is immigration. No, it is actually everybody. It is just a matter of time and who came what, at what point. And you can change the narrative as you want, but it is just a matter of who came at what point. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I'll stop there for, because I want to talk a little bit about Roger Williams, who I think uh, his story and mine are connected in many ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. This is my second time in this building, and I like it. And this, I've heard there's other parties that happen here, so I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> So, Eddie Tillage so Omar, um, yes, I run the other Policy Institute, the Latino Policy Institute. We've been around for um, this year, looking 19 years. Um, and 
Our organization has the same sense that uh, we focus primarily in the Latino community, which is the largest and fastest growing community in the country, in our state. Um, and it's how I, I identify my, my family and mom, and I immigrated from Colombia. And part of that is part of my identity, my history, the work I do today. Um, but I think one of the things that is really important is also acknowledging in our work um, that all Latinos are different, but that some Latinos are immigrants and some are not. Some of them come from this place called Puerto Rico. They're not immigrants. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, and so it's, you know, part of coming into this work has been really humbling because it teaches you about your identity in ways that you don't know and about the immigration history of your of your own people. Um, if every, any of you have heard of the Latino, um, that, oh my God, uh, Latino arts, Latino Arts. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful organization. Um, we have a beautiful little museum in Central Falls, which is where I'm from, um, the home of many immigrants. And Marta Martinez talks about the history of immigration, specifically of the Latino community. And she mentioned the first Latino immigrants, the first Mexican immigrants, came to East Greenwich. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know where they were going. <laughs> <laughs> They came in the middle of winter, they came in a train. Um, they were migrant workers. Um, and there's about three or four of them, and they just dropped them off in East Greenwich without coats. And let me tell you, this place like sucks without coats. <laughs> so it's really beautiful because, and as we were talking earlier, it's really in the work that we do, um, and that I do, most of them are like, oh, the Latino population is growing, and it's really important that we take care, like that we care about them. First, We've been here for longer than some of you have been here. We <laughs> belong to many of them before. Um, and similarly, I think, you know, in our in our work, we have to underscore too the importance of other immigrant communities. And for us, I take it as a responsibility that the state of Rhode Island has not yet understood how to take care of the largest community, the immigrant community, the largest community. Then how are you going to understand how to take care of the ones that are coming? So it is my responsibility to make sure we poke at government at every level so that when other other communities come next, that's what we do. Ms. Alex, since you have the microphone, what does civic engagement look like to you? Thank you. Um, I think for me, civic engagement looks like, in different levels, it looks like voting, it looks like running for office, it looks um, it looks like signing up people to vote when you are not able to vote yourself. It looks like testifying or sending letters to individuals. It also sometimes looks as simple as having a conversation at the dinner table. Um, and I say that because when we were talking, we were thinking about this theme, I thought about my experience with civic engagement. So I come from a I come from Colombia. I come from a country that many people vote, but many people also have a very interesting dynamic with what politics is back home, mm -hmm. right? And I grew up in a house that was very involved in politics. Some of our, my family members worked for, for the government, some others just criticized the government, just like you do. But I always, I grew up in a household where politics, politics was always part of our conversation. Mm -hmm. So when it came to this country, that stopped because my undocumented mother no longer understood American politics. Mm -hmm. It wasn't later until the American politics were coming for us that it became part of the conversation. So to me, I think that I think it starts at the dinner table because we have to think that civic engagement doesn't just mean that you're a US citizen that's allowed to vote. It means that conversation, it means something as simple. The first time I was civically engaged was at a protest. It was really cool. <laughs> um, big fan of them. Um, it was registering people to vote. It was uh, volunteering for a campaign. Because I think there are so many incredible levels that sometimes we don't think about right away, especially for people who are not citizens. Thank you so much for that. One of the rights that I am always fascinated about is the right to petition your government. And that right is inherently given to every single person who lives in our state and our territories. And I'm not sure that we are exercising that right enough. And so, Marba, what do you think, before you tell the story of Roger Williams, I know you wanted to do Roger Williams, <laughs> what are the barriers to civic participation that you see the most 
especially in the immigrant community, from your experience to working with immigrants. Well, thank you so much once again. I just, again, quick introduction. I work with immigrants and refugees. And it's not working. I work with immigrants and refugees. I'm the founder of the Refugee Dream Center. Mm -hmm. And we work with refugees from everywhere, from Latin America, from Africa, and the Middle East, and recently a little, a little from Ukraine. And um, what I've seen, uh, similar to what Marcella indicated, is when refugees reach the five-year mark, the first thing they think about is how to become citizens. Mm -hmm. They are very loyal to the United States. They want to belong. That is the piece. That's the number one most important to them. They want a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Because just remember, you know, you leave your home as an immigrant to go to another country, or you are you flee your country because of conflict or war, you lost everything. Mm -hmm. Even if that country or you the home you left was extremely poor, you still feel a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. So the thing you get with meaning here in the United States. You don't joke with that. The passport, the flag is very meaningful to them. So they want to be involved. But how can you be engaged when you don't know what is happening? Or you cannot probably sometimes read and write in English, or you cannot speak English. You don't even know how to register. And you are afraid. You're from country, for instance. You're from a war zone, or maybe you maybe even traveling to get here. The last thing you want is to get into trouble. So anything related to government, is attacked with some level of fear of vocationally. I have a lot of colleagues that I've worked with, that I work with, they would not go to the state house for a protest with me. Mm -hmm. And you know, like five, six, seven years ago, there were a lot of those, right? I mean, you know what happened. A lot of those protests, actually even before, after that, you know, George Floyd and other stuff, there were a lot of protests, but folks would not go. Oh, I have to play green card, I don't have a citizenship yet, I cannot go. Mm -hmm. But who said if you have a green card, you cannot go and sit to a protest? Or if you are just uh, a, 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 an I-94 holder, you cannot go to a protest. Mm -hmm. They don't want their names to be attached to any uh, petition because they think that will prevent them from getting citizenship. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it goes with fear, like they don't want to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. But if, let's now uh, fast forward a little bit they become citizens, you get a passport. Some don't vote because they don't know how to register. Or even if you help them to vote, what is the what is the the motivation to vote? And like you indicated earlier on, at some point it must dawn on you and it must come down very heavy before you really see the interest mm -hmm. in voting. Mm -hmm. I, I hear conversations right now. Mm -hmm. There are certain people that are like at the crossroads. What who would will they vote for when they are left with two options? Mm -hmm. Those are things that will come to, 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 to fruition. So maybe some folks will tell, oh, the passport is okay, let me just travel. As soon as I can travel back and forth, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But at what point do we transcend that reality where citizens or people who are legally resident will just go beyond just voting, beyond just traveling, beyond just needing a passport and get involved in their issues? A lot of people, especially African uh, immigrants, this problem school department mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk a lot of complaint i said but you don't you don't vote you don't do anything and then you still complain and then they have <laughs> so these conversations we have about people don't understand that that vote is important so i think it needs a lot of education and engagement mm -hmm. a lot of uh, involvement just education and outreach mm -hmm. and to make people understand the importance of voting Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omaba. Omaba is Dr. PhD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and again, he's an epitome of the contribution of African descent and, and people of African diaspora here around. And those stories are sometimes not told. And the perception that every single immigrant is a murderer or um, is a criminal or is this or that is really wrong. We just happened to come later on, because some of you were here before we came. And now we're trying to understand the system uh, and participate in the system. So one of the successes that I would uh, record here, because it's not always bad, it's a good part of uh, the work that we do, is the mobilization within the African diaspora community, especially in the last uh, one year or so. Uh, the United African Women Association of Rhode Island, some of them are here today. And before the last election, they really came out 
came together, mobilized, worked hard, were in the debates, in the rallies. They, they were registering people to vote, taking people to go vote. They were part of the voting process from beginning to the end. And that is a testament to really individuals who are willing to participate and understand the importance of participating in it. Like Dr. Omar said, we don't have to be citizens to participate. As long as we're part of the social fabric of this state, we do have the right either to attend protests, attend rallies, attend gatherings, attend debates, begin to understand how the system look and how the system work until we are citizens when we can vote. And so we have a block of individuals who already have organized and are ready to continue to provide the path to those who want to be part of our social and economic fabric. Rhode Island, each time I go into the state houses, they're a lively experiment. It's still an experiment, and that experiment is not done yet. Until we come to that place that is a perfect union, as we always say, that experiment is ongoing. And so we should be welcoming of immigrants that are coming into our country or new arrivals, however we classify them, and provide them that path to be participating in our social and, and civil uh, life. So I'll go back to uh, Ms. Misala again. So you, you talked about earlier on that uh, this is a kitchen table, start from, from the home. Recently we, we passed a law in Rhode Island that allows uh, 17 year olds to vote as long as they're going to be to vote in the primaries as long as they will be 18 by the general election. And what other policies do you think that we should begin to think about in Rhode Island that makes voting <coughs> easier? We heard about the John Lewis uh, uh, Act earlier on that is still languishing in, in our United States Congress and there's no appetite to pass that. It's important that we pass those type of laws. But there may be other policies that you're working on in your institute that opens that path for individuals to participate in our city life. Thank you for that question. And so I think this this is a really important question for me. So I, we were, Kat, the first time I met Kathy, yeah, the first time, we were working in a campaign in, with the League of Women Voters called Let Rhode Island Vote. It was a cluster of bills that pushed um, a lot of different uh, election access. So. We had an early voting for the first time, expanding mail ballots, security, and all these other things, and so that was really great. Um, and some, you know, we are strangely actually ahead of the game in some ways, but in some of them we're not. I think where we're still staying behind is the proposal that's right now at the state house, and I know the League of Women Voters is supportive, is same day voter registration. Um, so what that does, we there are I mean 17, 18 states around the country that. If any of you move the, the you know move to Rhode Island within the last thirty days, um, you should be able to vote when you know, like for and not just for the primary uh, presidential primary election, which you can, but for any other election, right? So general assembly will be up for primaries and general election this year as well. And if you moved, um, you should be able to register to vote. And that's not happening right now. And so we are, you know, we're in the same buckets right, right now as some of those states that are, are really restricting voting, like mm -hmm. Mississippi, et cetera. So you never want to be in that group because you never want to sit at that table. So I think that's one really that's really important. But another, so I also sit at the Rhode Island State Board of Elections. And I take that really seriously um, because I'm, I'm the youngest person there, but I'm also the only Latina in that state, in that, in that board. We talk about this all the time, about our job is to make voting safe and accessible. I sit there all the time and I say, but do these people know what that means? Um, one of the things that we're seeing happening is not what policies we need to pass, but what things government continues to try to roll back. So as I said, in 2022, we passed being able to provide the mail ballot access to the, the, you know, the deadline passed. There are legislators every day um, that are trying to roll back when you are able to access mail ballots mm -hmm. and where or how or who. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make sure that early voting dies. Uh, they're trying to make sure that we are, are like limiting the, how many places are you able to vote. So I think the thing that the policy that we work on and with every single work hat that I have on is not just how many things we're trying to push, because I think 
we're in a good place. We can obviously do more. I think the same day with voter registration is a really great deal. I, I love the you know that we're extended to 17 year olds, and I think we could do even more. But I also think that what we should be worried about is we live in a world, as you mentioned earlier, that democracy is like is it's sick. She's she's not doing okay. Um, she's in the ICU as we speak, and it's not really a joke. It's really serious, and it's happening in our states. And so if we're not careful within the next few years. We're going to roll back a lot of what we did in 2020. So that's what I would say we keep an eye on. Thank you, Ms. And, and to Dr. Uh, I, I, I didn't forget the other one, so. Ms. Hala's contribution here tonight makes me feel like people are afraid to open up access to voting, to make it easier. Because they're afraid to make voting easier. Why should we be afraid? to make voting easier for people. Shouldn't voting be easy for people? Great. Uh, thank you so much. I think you really hit the nail of the head on the head. I think a quick response to your question is the ones who should be, who will be voting then will be denied mm -hmm. to vote. Mm -hmm. And when you give them the opportunity to vote, the things that will be changed. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that change to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, Election day should be a holiday, holiday. public yes. holiday. Yeah. And uh, Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't comprehend, I still news over this. The biggest democracy, or maybe the, the part of democracy in the world, almost everywhere you go, even little Gambia, where I'm from, yeah. election day is a public holiday. Actually, it's like one of the biggest national holidays. You don't even think Ours about is on a Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Ours is on a Sunday, people. <laughs> right? <laughs> and in America, or probably only in America, I'm not sure, probably, but let's, for the purpose of this conversation, it is not a holiday in this country. And one would wonder, I mean, if you say it in any developing country or anywhere in the world, they would think you are joking. Mm -hmm. But it, it is by design. This is scripted and is, is framed. To fit one purpose, to achieve one purpose, and the purpose is prevent those who would otherwise vote from voting. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of folks who are first generation or people who are in entry level jobs, people in, in certain vulnerable or communities that are experiencing economic hardship, would be doing certain jobs, they cannot do quickly jobs to go and yeah. vote. Mm -hmm. So the idea is create some sort of barrier so that they will not cast that vote. So I mean, you make, if you make it a public holiday, there will be little change that will happen because all those people will have access to vote. So this is actually an impediment to democracy because we are preventing by on purpose, by design, a certain part of the population from voting. And I think that should be that should not even be part of the conversation right now. Actually, it is not only part of the conversation. The folks are talking about voter ID mm -hmm. in you know things that are so ridiculous because. Somebody, anybody who is not a citizen will not try to vote. Mm -hmm. If they vote, they will be arrested. It's a crime. Mm -hmm. So it's only citizens who will vote. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of voter ID? It's another barrier that is created to prevent folks from voting. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, in, just to add one more about elections, just do outreach. I think the Secretary of State's office can do more. Yes. Maybe the General Assembly can fund them more. If they are not funded, if they are funded, let them do more outreach. They, if they want people to register, they will register. Mm -hmm. Let them just do the job. I think those are some of the things that the immigrant community would need in order mm -hmm. to really participate. Mm -hmm. It is beyond lip service. There are things around <coughs> culture, there are things around access and culture. Just let me give you an example. Maybe Pastor Chris has not been in Nigeria for a long time, <laughs> <laughs> but I've been to Africa several times in recent years. <laughs> Quick refresher, Pastor. In Africa, you run for office, you're responsible for everything. Yeah. You are already like a millionaire, or probably a billionaire. You fund all the caravans, you fund all the women and youth groups and all the elderly groups and the religious leaders. You fund it. You have the money. In the US, the voters fund you. <laughs> How do you conceptualize for people to understand that notion? So it needs a lot of education, a lot of outreach. And I put that back to the Secretary of State's office. They need to do a lot of work, mm -hmm. of course, in partnership with communities mm -hmm. so that people can understand. Thank you, Dr. Barr. And, and just to say this, that Dr. Barr was a candidate for Congress. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> and 
you said something that is very pivotal, very important that I think that we should take home tonight. There should not be impediment to democracy. Should not be. Democracy should be open to the participants, and the participants in our democracy, the right to choose our leaders, so every single one of us who are in this room and those who are not here today. And voting should be easier, not harder. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ba, your story about uh, Tony <laughs> Williams. <Yeah. laughs> I thought we forgot. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the story. I came to Rhode Island in 17, well, it's gonna be 17 in May, 17 years ago, May 24th. And um, I heard about the state one day before arrival. I was in a refugee camp in Ghana. And um, my caseworker at the IOM said, oh, you're going to Providence. I said, what, what the heck is that? Is, is it like a church or what? <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to, is the church going to protect you out there? The churches have people in America, right? <laughs> it didn't even sound beautiful, you know, so. He said, oh, no, it's not, a, it's not a church. Probably some churches will support you when you go. I'm not, don't get me wrong, but it's the capital city of Rhode Island. I said, all right, now this is a problem. The American embassy told me I'm going to America, not an <laughs> island. <laughs> this was one day before my travel. If I a refugee, very cheap, I was probably like 110 pounds, very hungry and exhausted. My only source of hope, now they tell me I'm going to an island. After all the problems, <laughs> after all the problems, I think the guy was just so exhausted about my ridiculous uh, uh, drama and showed me a wall a wall where there was a large map of the US and he tapped on Rhode Island and said, this is what I am going to America. <laughs> I said, like, all right, end of story. I stopped talking about it. <laughs> so when I arrived here and the first lesson they told me at Dorcas, you know, yeah. formerly International Institute, they picked me up at the airport and said, oh, you know, you are, you are a former journalist. You ran away from uh, injustice, and we came to a state founded by somebody similar. I said, who is that? They said, well, Roger Williams was also a refugee. He founded this state. I said, all right, that guy is going to be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and, and the other amazing part is that Roger Williams was a refugee. <laughs> <laughs> And when we talk about refugees today, it's a different connotation than it was in the times of Roger Williams. Mm -hmm. And that's how we have evolved as a society. And I hope that we can retune our minds back to the past mm -hmm. and begin again to look at the present as we looked at the past before. Mm -hmm. That folks who came from all the places, even though they don't look like us, are just human beings. Mm -hmm or seeking opportunities and seeking a life mm -hmm. so they can raise family and have the life that some of us here have enjoyed, all of us if not have enjoyed. So that struck me when he said that Roger Williams was a refugee. Mm -hmm. And if that's how refugees look like, I would like to be one. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be one. Well. Um, just keeping the conversation going. How many more minutes? Uh, we got ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. That's great. <laughs> Keep the conversation going, <laughs> Masala. When you look at our politics today, mm -hmm. whether it be here in the state house or national politics, and each time you hear or I hear how leaders and politicians describe immigrants mm -hmm. and even immigration mm -hmm. in of itself. How does that encourage or discourage those of us who are immigrants mm -hmm. in participating in the civic life mm -hmm. that we should be? Thank you for that question. Um, so I, you know, we keep mentioning of the, the historic like waves of immigrants, and I keep thinking about what each wave has been thought of, and we've always, you know, whatever Irish, whatever it is, like always. They're dangerous, and they're poor, and they're not like us. Um, and that's what we're hearing today, right? So this idea that in the last couple of years, really, it's gotten bad. It was always bad, but I think since the pandemic, the idea that we've closed the border up to refugees. Um, I think we're, we're talking about individuals as dangerous, and 
um, you know, they're bringing the worst, right? Um, I think that's a really, really difficult thing because the truth is that when they eventually get into like the mainland of, of the US, that, that mindset doesn't go away, not only for them, but for who around them. So, you know, I'm hoping, I don't wanna make assumptions, but I, I wanna hope that some of you, um, if you live next to an immigrant, you would be at least a little bit kind to them. Maybe, I don't, we don't know. Um, truth is that we all have fears because that they're instilled in us by politics and by government. So they told each and every one of us, no matter what we look like or where we come from, that African refugees are taking away from your people. And the Latinos, all those people, all those Mexicans are taking your money and your jobs. So they're gonna pin us against each other and they've done that. They've done that historically. And when we come here, that continues. And truth is, you know, what Omar was saying of the lack of participation, even once you become a legal resident or a citizen, that's instilled in you. People hate, like this country hates you. So why would you love it back? That's really hard. I think hearing you and, and the idea what you were talking about, like being really proud, when my parents became legal, like, I mean citizens, I was I actually, it was very difficult for me. Because I, you know, I lived to two undocumented people for a lot of my youth. And I remember how hard that was. And I worked for an organization that dealt with undocumented people, and I know how much they're discriminated against every day. And so it was really hard for me to t like see them, and I was so proud of them because you could see years of relief. Like, have you ever like when you get home and you're tired, you're like, oh. <laughs> imagine years of being afraid. <clears throat> years of being afraid to say, like, come off of you, right? But the thing is, that doesn't mean that because they're U.S. citizens. That the world, like the U.S., is like hating who they are sometimes. And that's really hard. Um, and so I think what I, what, why it's important, you know, I when I hear Omar talk is talk to someone who doesn't look like you. Like refugees and like immigrants bring beautiful things. Yes, and that's why it's important that our, we make sure that our people are there for voting. That's why even if they can't vote, how do we get together? There's support groups to make sure that they're participating. Because truth is. There's always going to be politics and other people who don't understand the beauty that comes with us and the pain that comes with us, and the trauma that stays with our generations. So I think it's really important that um, that we keep talking about it. It's never, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's ever going to go away. This country is built on racism. Um, it's just a real thing. And part of that is never going to go away. So we just have to make sure that how we treat each other comes with love, even when we don't fully understand the experience of these Thank you. Just quickly to add to that, thank, thank you for tackling this. These are sometimes difficult things to say, but that's the reality. We are in an election year, and we have to be really cognizant of the realities of what is being said right now. The southern U.S. border right now, there's a crisis. And then nobody says open the borders for 7 billion people to enter. How practically is that even possible? So it is not about immigration. This is about... Uh, it's, it's, it's about identity, it's about othering people. Mm -hmm. Currently, tr Trump, Trump's campaign is at loggerheads with the two Congos. Probably many Americans don't know about that, but his supporters know that. The two Congos, their embassies is with statements reprimanding Trump for accusing their countries of releasing their prisons and sending them to Mexico to cross the border so that they can come and attack and rape American guards. Yeah. Those that go, to go online, you see, you see him saying that, and the two Congos are very angry. What, why do you think he will be saying that? Oh, you're already used to the Latinos coming, maybe they're not afraid of them anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's create a new mm -hmm. idea of what immigration means so that they can really be fearful of them. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what immigration is. Immigration is not about the movement mm -hmm. from one country to the other. Mm -hmm. It's about othering. Look at these kind of people and be very afraid of them. And that is what and that is actually deciding this year's election. Go to every poll. Is the big thing is about uh, immigration. So then, then it behoves us as immigrants. Actually, let me rewind. It behoves us, fellow Americans. Let us be uh, do our part by one learning, learn about immigrants, befriend immigrants, learn, be open-minded and be non-judgmental know about them, participate and be, be, be partners. 
Otherwise, we will all be somehow, directly or subtly, uh, perpetuating that kind of uh, order racism and, and, and fear factor. How can people be so fearful that they will decide the outcome of an election? And that is what is happening right now. Thank you so very much, Doctor. You talk about the fear factor. Yeah. And so it's time to ask questions from the participant here today. So don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that there's no fear factor. <laughs> All right. So we can take a couple of questions uh, before we close. Um, yeah, you got your hand up first. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, early voting is still on. You can. Um, it, it closes the day before, so April first. Go all the way up to April first. So whatever city you live in, go to city hall. Make sure it should be between eight and four. Most cities. Cranston sometimes is a little flexible. Is that great? I don't actually live in Cranston. Can we just start clarifying that it's just primary? Primaries. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Yes, it's presidential primaries. Thank you, sir. Yes, it, this is presidential primaries. So you will be voting for a nice thing too. Vote. Vote and vote. That's our <laughs> call to action today. Each and every one of us. Yes. All right, so I'm going to piggyback on what you were saying. Just like how you say all Latinos are not the same. Mm -hmm. And um, I am, we were introducing ourselves the other day, and I introduced myself, I said, I am Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. Liberian, Nigerian, Guinean, Barbadian, <laughs> and somewhat American once removed. <laughs> because we, when we trace our roots, because we were on a slave ship on oh. my, on my mom's side of the family, and we were Africans that went back. Oh. After the American Revolution, the English took South Africa south. And I'm a product of them. They took us first to Nova Scotia. Yeah. It was too cold. And then they took us to Sierra Leone, <laughs> where they actually bought the land, three towns, for the three yeah. slaves. So, so sometimes I say I'm a product of three slaves, and people are like, but you're African. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so if I do my DNA, my, my son is always saying, do your DNA so you can know exactly where we're from. <laughs> because we can be of any part of the West African countries. Um, so, I'm happy that you said all Latinos are not the same. Yeah. Because a lot of times, sorry for our Nigerian, most of the time, people assume all Africans are Nigerian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they assume that Africa is a country yeah. and not a continent. Yeah. <laughs> if we had a dollar for every time someone said that, reparations would have happened. Yeah. So, so sometimes it's hard because I grew up here. And so, and I hear like what you're saying about the fear and the and the, and the ignorance. And I work at the VA, and I remember when Ebola came out, of course it affected Sierra Leone. And I'm speaking to a nurse that said to me, these people affected with this disease because they jerked. Oh. Oh. She didn't even know I was African. First of all, to be Sierra Leone, she didn't even know I was African. So she felt like, people feel like, or oh, I met a guy that says the immigrants are getting everything. And I'm like, my mom got here, what did she get? I remember going to work under the cold, doing a leaving job, and nothing was handed to her. She got what she got because she worked for it. So, I mean, I think this is wonderful that we're having these conversations day to day because if you don't know a person who are, who's an immigrant, you're not gonna know. And like Pastor Chris, what you said, pe Americans don't know how much money immigration brings in. Mm -hmm. A thousand and change for each four. <laughs> and I'm like, and somebody was telling us Nigeria has multiple um, visa centers and they are full every day. And they collect these money from these people for the country. So the amount of money that's coming in that people I don't even understand, like day-to-day -day Americans don't even understand that America is making money off of immigrants mm -hmm. and they think immigrants are taking money away from America. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we need to like, and can't yeah. people like empower people about. And, and yes, yes, and I think because I, I think this is the conversation of, of when we live in closed circles and when we don't even know. I think it's 
even within our own communities, right? If you stay within your own community, even like I will be the first one to say, there are probably too many problematic Latinos. Sometimes we need to be, we, there's a lot of re-education and knowledge that needs to be done within your own community too, because it's, but it's that. It, it, so, so to your point, I, we, so the Economic Progress Institute, the executive director that we own, Latinos is in the back. Um, my organizations have done actually this paper about how many undocumented, undocumented Rhode, like Rhode Islanders bring about like $30 million. Hmm. That's a lot of money to people. It's a lot of money to this state, baby state. 30 million, right? That's a huge amount of money. And so to your point, we we decry immigration because it's easy, because it's a fear thing, but the amount of money that, you, that we bring is incredible. And so I think part of the conversation has to be for us to to talk, of, like when I talk about my immigration story today, I was at a meeting at the Board of Elections. There's a bill that was just proposed about, we should put in the, we should put in the Constitution that only citizens should ever be able to vote. I'm like, that's already a thing. But part of it comes from this fear of, because we gave undocumented Rhode Islanders access to driver's licenses, so what happened? Fear. Oh my god, all these illegals. Oh, they don't, they know they can't vote. And, you know, citizens don't vote, so why are they doing it? Um, but it's part of it. Part of it is that I, just, I sat with this man and I said, actually, let me tell you about when my parents became citizens. And this man was surprised. Half of the time, uh, in like one, the United States doesn't teach you history. They have no idea that, that Africa has like many, many, many countries. Latin America is not Mexico. I've never had a taco in my life before coming here. Spoiler alert, we don't eat tacos in South America. Um, and so that's a huge thing, it's having conversations of, with individuals, but also within our own people, because there's also a lot of work that we need to do within our community. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. All right. Um, how far are we from the same day voting and other laws ago? That seems like such a no-brainer, you know. Uh, but also, what can you do as a member of the Board of Elections? Does that give you a chance to influence them? That's a great question. So the, I'll answer the last part first. So the board, um, as part of a seven-member board, we voted to support the legislation. And there was a lot of conversations around it because logistically it could be difficult because it includes more paperwork. And sometimes government cares a lot about paperwork. <laughs> um, but it was really important for us to continue pushing our members to support it because when the, these bills are heard, they ask the Board of Elections, who's gonna handle it? Do you support it? And it was really important for us to say that. So when you ask about how far it is, um, so both bills have been introduced in the Senate and the House. They have not been heard, we just talked about it. They have not been heard yet. Um, and one of them is by Representative Isate, and the other one is by Senator. I don't remember. This is not me not doing my job, I'm so sorry. But so both both bills are, are are introduced. To be honest, I don't know how much of a possibility they have to pass. The biggest truth is, um, it is really hard for elected officials to provide access to vote. Mm. That, that, that's just that simple. Because when it would do, it becomes a constitution. It like so, the legislation would make it a constitutional change. So yeah. it means that in November, when we get our ballot, it would be a question. Is this the first time this has come up? No, year year? It's, it's been a few years. Yeah. Um, last year, it got a lot of traction. Yeah. And this year, there's a big you know, coalition that's doing it. Yeah. But sadly, I, like many, like a lot of legislation, I think this is gonna be one that is gonna be a lot, a lot of poking um, and a lot of work. And this is, this is sucks to say out loud, but sometimes when really, really bad things happen in our democracy, that's when the state of Rhode Island actually acts. Mm -hmm. So I'm really, that's, that's, that's really, because it happens the same thing with immigration. <laughs> after, after 2016, suddenly Rhode Island cared about immigrants. It was really interesting. Um, and so I think that would be the only thing, but call your legislator and tell them you support the state of education. That's exactly right. And that's another call for action. Again, to petition your government, call your legislators, call the people in General Assembly, and ask them to support that bill. And you can write letters. You can write emails. You can make phone calls. You can stop. I mean, you don't have to be a citizen to. You don't have to be a citizen to do that because you're part of this lively experiment. All right. All right. We got a question at the back. Yes. Um, let's go back to the beginning. 
Uh, could you talk about when did you find out your social board? When you went voting? What happened in the day after? Could you share your experience? Yes, my experience is this. My vote here in the United States was the first time I ever voted, and I was so proud to vote on that day because I never experienced voting in my birth country for the same reason that in those countries, most of it, your vote doesn't count. The elections are decided before the elections are held. There's voters intimidation, there's opposition killings, and so people are just so scared to vote. And so coming to America and become a citizen of the United States and my first day going to vote, was such a great experience for me. And that was my springboard for my civic engagement and becoming more and more participating in my own community that led me to where I'm at today. So voting for an average immigrant is very treasured, very treasured. So it's always an opportunity to do that. So that's my story and I will let uh, Dr. Ma yeah, almost similar, very similar. You know, where I'm from, there was a dictatorship. Uh, voting was not too important because one person ruled and decided everything. And I became a citizen in 2012. And I happened in November was supposed to be my first time to vote. I really, really yearned to vote in person. Then I happened to be out of the country. I did upset uh, the 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 no the early the early voting yeah. It was meaningful, but I still felt something was still missing. <laughs> Four years later, I, it, the same thing happened to me again. <laughs> but luckily, uh, like two years ago, I ended up voting in person, but for myself, which is I think, <laughs> uh, the candidate. <laughs> so I made up for the lost time. <laughs> My first time, so I am a U.S. citizen. I was born here, went back to the so I was a U.S. citizen. My first time voting was in 2007. Um, and I remember really, like, being really excited. It was like my first year of college. I was really, you know, a little bushy at tail. I voted Republican the first time because I was raised Catholic, so it was very, it was very interesting. So it's a whole different lifetime from where we've been now. Um, but it was great. I really, I really enjoyed it. And I now, I my parents are super voters because I forced them to go vote early. I'm like, don't be giving the ass on voting day. Just go in early voting. So it's really exciting. So I, I now encourage everyone in my family and force everybody to vote. Thank you so very much. We got one question, and then we'll give it back. So that will be our final question. I'll try to be really quick because um, because so much comes up in my mind. I'm an immigrant to Rhode Island um, not quite two years ago from New York, and I think my experience is similar in some ways because I had to sort of hide my New York identity and sort of learn how to drive like a Rhode Islander. And <laughs> <laughs> not to target the people. Who <laughs> but um, I wanted to bring up a concept that is um, not original for me, but um, a book that was written a couple of years ago, I think pre or during COVID, um, called The Sum of Us, um, and it's by um, McGee. McGee, yes, yeah, and Peta yeah. McGee, I think yeah. her name. And she posits this idea that part of the problem with othering mm -hmm. is this sense of zero sum. Mm -hmm. Like, in order for you to come, I lose something. Mm -hmm. And she flips it on its head and simply states that unless we are getting the best of what everyone has to offer mm -hmm. um, by not being a zero-sum mindset, yeah. we're not getting the best. We're only getting the best of a small predetermined group, which That's is right. kind of sad. Mm -hmm. So there's that. The other thing I wanted to sort of bring into the conversation is I know um, the years that I was in K through 12, and particularly most significantly um, mm -hmm. 9 through 12, my high school years, civic civics as a subject had completely disappeared. So mm -hmm. I submit you are fighting a double uphill battle because mm -hmm. you're having to educate your um, immigrant communities mm -hmm. as to how to navigate um, mm -hmm. democracy in this country, but you're also working with people who don't even know. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say I'm fairly ignorant of all of the policies and procedures mm -hmm. because I never got that education. And I think what took its place sort of was before I got to college, there was a lot of protests going on in the 
late 60s, early 70s. Then by the time I got to college, all of that had flipped over and become apathy. So mm -hmm. a lot of people in America who are at the birthright have a little bit of lethargy, and then they see all of these very activist immigrants coming in wanting to vote, and they're like terrified of that. So yeah. you're fighting a double uphill battle. And um, it's, I just, I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing, and I think it's really important that we get the best of every, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is I think that moving around is uh, around the planet is a human thing that people do. We have this huge, almost continent worth of a country that we move around freely in, mm -hmm. and um, so we don't have that same sensibility about um, crossing borders, and I think borders need to be identified as um, constructs. They are completely abstract, they are not natural. Uh, Thank you so very much for that. that. We truly appreciate that. we got one more minute, and we we'll take a very quick question. Just a comment that um, related to voting and civic engagement. 34 years ago, in 1990, I was on, I did work on the Fred Lippitt campaign. He was trying to become mayor, and he actually lost by 317 votes. That's what I did mm -hmm. And so how, that shows you how important each vote really is. And you mentioned voting Republican. When I was um, 18 and ready to vote, my family said, we're Democrats, and you go into the booth, and there's this master lever, and you say, like, <laughs> <laughs> and then when Fred Lippitt ran for, he was considered on the east side Mr. Republican, yeah. and he was always a, a Republican, but when he ran for mayor, he um, ran as an independent, and I knew a lot of people who were working on his campaign, and when they tried to and work on his campaign, I said, I'm a Democrat, I'm just a Republican. I just pulled the mask together. But because so many people that I knew worked on his campaign, I started working on his campaign, and he was, and you know, it's so beautiful to be, I have never been in the Olympic um, Museum, so because he is a part of this family, it's a beautiful thing to have see this conversation mm -hmm. here. And he was a great man, and I think he would have been, he was the Thank you so very much. Now, Ms. what's your call to action today? Um, well, if you haven't voted, go early. Early voting is so much better. <laughs> I'm a really big fan. But it, like Omar, I get it. Like, it feels really nice on election day. Um, so I would say that. And also, be civically engaged in another way that's not voting. I really do think, and thank you for highlighting that. I, whatever way it is, even if it's calling one of your legislators for something or meeting them, um, if it's one day attending a protest, because they're really fun. <laughs> um, I do. I think it's really important that even you know many of you have have like voted many times and have, are, are you know have lived many lives, but I think. Being civically engaged in a new way, it might be a really important thing, and you could be an example for someone who hasn't done it before. Yeah, yeah I'll just add to that. Don't leave it to the immigrants. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't, but don't fight for them. Fight with them. You know? yes. let, let, if you speak for somebody, you're disempowering them. Let it, let it be a transactional interaction where you are working together. But anyway, it cannot be their own thing. It's our problem and our challenge. So, but for the immigrants and refugees, or whoever you are, please vote, get involved, get engaged, you know, participate in whatever is happening in your community. And it's not only about voting, it could be about being, just speaking up about something, protesting or petitioning or doing, getting, knowing what is happening on your school department, whatever is going on in your community, just get involved. Omar, could you tell people what Isabel put on the chairs? Oh, okay. So, yeah, thank you, Kathy. So, Isabel, one of my co-workers has our flyers up in the chairs. We walk, I work for the Refugee Dream Center, which I founded. We resettle refugees, so find the information there. Uh, uh, it, it, it speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Omar. We are a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And so we must organize and influence policies that are made in our state houses. Policies are long-lasting. Protests are good. They're fun. But policies are long-lasting. You have the power to influence the policy 
that you live by. Thank you, and thank you for coming today. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Ben Cooper, and I am with the Providence League of Women Voters. And I absolutely want to thank our speakers tonight. They were wonderful. Um, if you, like me, have felt a little bit discouraged about our democracy, I think listening to the power of the immigrants and their belief in what we have in this country has got to inspire you. I know it's inspired me, and I'm just so much better. Than I <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for the work that you've done. Um, and I would just echo vote, 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 and vote again. Vote only once. <laughs> <laughs> um, so make sure you know where your polling place is. If you don't, if you're not going to do early voting, you're going to go on election day. Don't be surprised. Check before you go. So thank you, and thank you to Liberty House. This was wonderful. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's also a survey. Uh, survey on your chair. There's also a QR code if you want to do it that way. Same survey. Uh, so you do a paper one. Uh, there's four to there. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. <laughs>